while the children's going through, if you could find the book of Acts, chapter 26 tonight, please. Praise the Lord. Let's keep the noise down to a gentle shout tonight, eh? Before we do anything, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's ask the Lord to open our eyes and our hearts tonight. Father, Lord God, as we as we're gathered in this place, Lord, to come under your word, Lord, I ask for a special blessing, Lord, tonight. For each and every person that's in this building, Father, I pray, Lord, that you would give us spiritual eyes to to, to see, Lord, and ears to hear, and a heart to receive. The Lord, you would plant the seed of your word deep within our hearts, my Lord, and that it would grow and it would cause a, a bountiful fruit, Lord, to, to grow in our lives, that we would be changed. The Lord, we would leave this place more like you and less like us, that it wouldn't just be knowledge for knowledge's sake, but the Lord our lives would be conformed to your image and likeness. Lord, this is what we desire. We desire you in this meeting. Nothing of this man, nothing of this flesh. Lord, my ideas are not worth a penny. But Lord, we wish and we desire to hear from you tonight. So please, Lord, fill my mouth, Lord, from the throne of heaven and place it deep within your people's hearts, I ask, Lord. Bypass me and say exactly what you would have said according to your spirit. In Jesus' name I pray and I ask. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. The Brothers has asked me to carry on the, um, the study you have been going through in the book of Acts. We find ourselves in Acts chapter 26 tonight. Now I know the Brothers has already preached the way through the rest of the book, but just for myself, nothing, not a reflection on them, but for myself I would like to just give you a bit of background just so I don't go off track. So far, what's happened to land Paul in prison and the situation that he's in now? Paul had returned from his missionary journeys to Jerusalem. When he went to the temple and he was preaching that there was salvations for the Gentiles as well as the Jews. And because he was preaching this message of salvation for everyone, the Jewish people got very, very highly strung over it. They called him a blasphemer and they were looking to end his life. So in order to save any kind of riot, the Roman soldiers got involved, they arrested Paul, they took him, they imprisoned him. There is no charges that they can bring against him. He, he sat under, under Felix. Felix heard he could bring no judgment. Paul was innocent. But there is a new prosecutor, there is a new judge for the Romans. And it is this man Festus. He is now taking the place of Felix. And he has inherited Paul as a prisoner. And he has absolutely no clue why. So he hears Paul in a private, in a private hearing to hear what was going on. And they brought his accus accusers against him. And again, they could find no fault in Paul. The things that he was accused of didn't stand. There was no foundation for them. But because it would cause an absolute uproar if they were to release Paul, they couldn't release him either. So this man finds himself in this sort of a conundrum. If I release him, there's going to be an uproar. But I have absolutely nothing to charge him with. Paul has spent two years in this prison. Two years Paul has spent in a prison that is little more than a dungeon. I'm 
And because it was a stalemate, nothing was moving any further. Paul had a right as a Roman citizen to say, I appeal to Caesar. Take me to the high court of Caesar. Paul was happy to do so. The Lord had already spoke to him and told him that he was to stand trial in Rome. Paul wanted to go to Rome. So in order to break this stalemate that they were in, he says, I appeal to Caesar. By the way, Nero was Caesar at the time. To appeal to a madman. Let's you know the conditions that Paul's in. Well, he appeals to Caesar. And that brings us to the section that we're in now. King Agrippa, king of the Jews, has come and he is paying his respects to the, the new governor, Festus. And as he's paying his respects to this new governor, he lets him know, listen, I've inherited a problem. I have this man, Paul. And to be honest with you, I've heard him out, but I, he was a Roman. He didn't really understand Jewish law or custom. I don't really understand what the big issue is. I don't understand what he's doing here. He's appealed to Caesar, but I've got him here. Could you please just come and try and clarify what's going on? And King Agrippa says, you know what? I'll hear him out. So that's the backstory. That's what brings us to the section that we're at tonight. And if we could please just start our study, I know we're in 26, but I just want to go back a little bit. Back into chapter 25 and verse 23. And we're going to read from the word of the Lord. So on the next day, when King Agrippa came together with Bernice, amid great pomp, and entered into the auditorium, accompanied by the commanders and the prominent men of the city. At the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. Now, this man, King Agrippa, a little bit of personal history. King Agrippa II, this is, he is the last of the Herodian family. If the brothers have been through the book of Acts, you will probably remember his father, King Agrippa I, the man that exalted himself above God. He had a, a, an Agrippa day. And it says that God killed him in the worm's head. Or maybe you'll remember the uncle that be, beheaded John the Baptist. Or maybe you'll remember the grandfather that had all the male children in Israel killed. This is the lineage of this man, King Herod Agrippa. And he comes here, and you will notice that he's come with a woman called Bernice. And everywhere that you see King Agrippa, you will see the name Bernice. Bernice, Bernice. King Agrippa stood up and Bernice with him. King Agrippa done this and Bernice with him. Bernice was his sister. And they were involved in an incestuous relationship with each other. The Holy Spirit never mentions King Agrippa without mentioning Bernice, like that hidden sin that just follows him around wherever he goes. But the Bible tells us that they arrive to this auditorium and it's filled to capacity with all the prominent people of the town, Caesarea. With all the governors, all the officials, all the commanders of the guards, and they're all packed into this auditorium. And it says they arrive with great pomp. It's where we get the word pompous from. I could just imagine it in my mind's eye. The Roman governor decked out with his scarlet robe. And the, the crown of gold. I can just imagine. King Herod. Agrippa. Decked out in his purple robes and bareness. His sickly little sister with him. All decked out in her finery and gold and purple robes. And they're sitting there like butter wouldn't melt. Like they're the best thing that had ever happened to this world. All these fancy, high-placed, prominent people of the time. 
then in walks poor old Paul. An old man at this time, bent over, arthritic, maybe about two stone of weight, maybe a problem with his eyes, had a hard life, whipped, beaten many, many times, maybe struggling to stand up straight with an old two-year-old tunic on. This man, what they don't realise. But the change that he's got on in the dirty rags clothes is more free than they ever are. They are slaves to sin. And they are about to hear from the most freest man that's in that auditorium. And they don't even know it. Read with me, please. Chapter 26. So they've got what they've come for. And Agrippa says to Paul, You are permitted to speak for yourself. Now, Paul has been given an opportunity to speak on his own behalf. Now, I'm going to be honest, if it was me, after two years in a, a dirty damp dungeon jail cell, I would be on my hands and knees, please let me go, please, I'm begging of you, let me go, I've had enough. Paul's a better man than I. Paul uses this situation to preach the gospel. <coughs> Paul takes this one opportunity that he has and he is solely focused on King Agrippa. Why? Because King Agrippa, he may be a puppet king, he may be controlled by the Romans, but he is the king of the Jewish people. And if he can win him for Christ, if he can win him for the Lord, well, there is no more powerful ally than you can have. <coughs> so Paul is given an opportunity to speak for himself. And he brings over his own personal testimony and the gospel message attached to it. And I just want to walk through this very... Look, there's a lot to go through tonight, but I'm going to go through it as quick as I can. And I want to give you an overall picture of how clever and how genius Paul actually is. And how much the Holy Spirit used him that day. And if I had to put a title to this message at all, it would be this. The world's conclusion to a faithful witness. He says in verse 3, sorry, verse 2 and 3. In regard to all things that I am accused by the Jews, I consider myself fortunate, King Agrippa, that I am about to make my defence before you today, especially because you are an expert in all the customs and the questions among the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. He is held by Romans. They haven't got a clue what he's talking about. The governor Festus wasn't there when Jesus was crucified. He doesn't understand Jewish law or tradition. But now that Paul has got a platform that he can talk to somebody that knows all about the Jewish traditions and the Jewish laws... He can talk to somebody that's going to understand. He can get his point across to somebody. And hopefully he can see salvation come to somebody. And he starts off the way every good witness should start off. And it's his own personal testimony as to what Jesus Christ has done in his life. Please read with him if you will. This is where you start to see Paul's genius and his wisdom come into play. Verse 5. He says, since they have known about me for a long time, if they are willing to testify that I lived as a Pharisee, 
to the strictest sect of the religion. Paul starts his story by telling them that he was a man that was involved in religion. Not just involved in religion. No, he was of the strictest sect of that religion. He was a Pharisee. Not just that. But he goes on to tell us in verse 10. That when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. He tells us that not only was he a Pharisee of the strictest sect, but he persecuted those that would come against his religion, the church of Jesus Christ. And the fact that he was able to cast a vote tells us that he was a member of the Sanhedrin Council. What does this mean? This means that if you were to take Paul, he is at the pinnacle of religion. The same as Nicodemus. When Nicodemus came to Jesus in John chapter 3, Nicodemus was a member of the Sanhedrin Council. He was a Pharisee. Jesus referred to him as the teacher of Israel. They were at the pinnacle of religion. But I want to tell you something. Their religion could do nothing for them. Nicodemus was told, yes, fair enough. You're at the pinnacle of religion. You're about as far as what religion will take you. But guess what? Nicodemus, unless you are born again of the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. And the same thing Paul is saying about himself. I was at the pinnacle of religion. I had it all. I had money. I had power. I had authority. But I never had Jesus Christ. I never had God. I knew about God. I studied the Old Testament scriptures every day of my life. And I knew all there was to know about him. But I didn't know him. And when the people that represented them came in the flesh, I took them, I rounded them up like sheep, and I slaughtered them. So much so, he tells us, that he followed them to foreign countries. How much zeal did this man have? That he would follow people to a foreign country in order that he could kill every last one of them. Paul had religion, but Paul never had God. <coughs> now look, if you will, the first half of his testimony tells us about the man that he used to be. Verse 12 says this. And while I was engaged in Damascus, he was going to Damascus to round these people up to kill them. With the authority and the commission of the chief priests, at midday, O king, on the way I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining all around me and those who were with me. Paul, I'm sure the brothers has already preached it. He's only recanting what was said before in Acts. And I'm only going to go over it quickly. Paul had a meeting with the true and the living God. And he puts it in a way that's really going to push King Agrippa's buttons. See, when he talks about this light that came that was brighter than the sun. See, the Jewish people, they knew God as light. I want to give you some scriptures from the Old Testament. Isaiah 60 and verse 1 says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord shines over you. Psalm 36 verse 9, For the wellspring of life is within you, by means of your light we see. Micah 7 verse 8, Do not rejoice over me, my enemy, though I have fallen, I will stand up, though I sit in darkness, the Lord will be my light. The Jewish people, they associated light with God. And Paul goes on to tell us this experience, this encounter that he had with Jesus Christ. It tells us, this voice came to me. 
And they spoke in Hebrew. Beating around about the bush. He's telling King Agrippa, I have met with the God of Israel. The God of the Hebrews. And when I asked him what his name was, when I said to him, Lord, who are you? He says, I am Jesus Christ, whom you persecute. Paul tells King Agrippa in no uncertain circumstances that he wouldn't understand that Jesus Christ is God. And I had a personal encounter with him. And like every Christian and everybody that has given their life to Jesus Christ in here, regardless of what he was wrapped up in, regardless of the religion that he had, when he truly met face to face with Jesus Christ, his life was changed forever. Paul got up and he walked away a different man than he was going to Damascus. And it was all for the glory of Jesus Christ. Can I hear an amen in you today? Amen. Anybody that truly meets with Jesus Christ his life is going to be changed. There is nobody within scripture. I promise you, friend, I have read this from one end to the other and there is nobody, nobody that has had a real true meeting with Jesus Christ that has walked away the same way they ever walked. I want to tell you, if you're living the life that you've always lived in here, you haven't met Jesus Christ. If you're caught up in your religion and your traditions, you haven't met with Jesus Christ. Anybody that meets with Jesus Christ walks away a different man or walks away a different woman. And Paul is living proof of that. So we have Paul that's standing with this time that he's got to explain his case. And the first thing that he does is he tells them his own personal testimony. How important is your testimony? How important is your testimony in here? should be the first thing that when we're out witnessing, when we see somebody, when we have an opportunity to share the gospel, the first thing we should do is, I know a man that came into my life and changed me. And I'm going to tell you all about that man. Paul shares his personal testimony. He tells them about the man that he used to be. And now he goes on to tell them about the man that he is, the man that God has made him, how he set him apart to be a, a, a minister of the gospel. And that he would be an apostle to the Gentiles. And for what reason? Why did God appoint him to be a minister and an apostle to the Gentiles? And we see that in verse, verse 18. To open their eyes so that they may turn from the darkness to the light and from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness for sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. Paul says in no uncertain terms that the reason that he preaches, the whole point of his ministry is to take people from the kingdom of darkness, from the kingdom of Satan, and to transport them from that kingdom that they are caught up in, and to transport them into the kingdom of light, the kingdom of God. That is the reason why Paul was made a minister for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he goes on and he says, Verse 19 says, And so, King Agrippa, I did not disprove disobedient to the heavenly vision. Let me give you a little bit of application for my life and your life. And I want to tell you something. This is something that I need to change. I speak to myself before I speak to any of you. Please, give me a break. <coughs> Listen to me on this. Me and you, we are far too emotionally driven. We go by our feelings. I will share the gospel when it, when it suits me, when I feel like it. Or if I feel that I've got a good opening. I will tell people about Jesus when I seem to be having a good day. And when, you know, on my off days, I'm, I'm, I don't know, I'm not so quick to, 
to start witnessing, to, to start telling people about Jesus. You and I need to leave this place with a different mind frame, and it's this. The same mind frame that Paul had. Whatever opportunity you are given, grasp it. Take hold of that opportunity because you may never get another one. Don't go by your feelings. Don't go by how you feel on that day. But God has given you something wonderful and it is to be a light bearer to this dark, horrible world. And you have the power of life within your mouth to speak the gospel message that will transport those people from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Please, brothers and sisters, I will take this on board as much as I possibly can for my own sake. Let's not be the people that just wait till there's an absolute opportune time that just smacks us dead in the face that never really arrives. But let's be the people like Paul. I don't really care what situation I'm in. I am going to minister and preach the gospel to whoever will listen to me. If you give me a platform for anything at all, it's going to be to preach the gospel. It's going to be to share my personal testimony. And it's going to be to do my absolute best to see people transported from this dark, wicked kingdom into God's kingdom. Sometimes we forget the value in being a faithful witness. God has given us something so wonderful it's our personal testimony that we can share. And it's not our testimony, it's God's testimony of what he's done in our life. But you understand what I mean? It's ours to share with our world. Paul uses no fancy words. Paul says that, he says in his letters that, you know, I think it was uh, 2 Corinthians, he says, I never came to you with fancy words, lest the, the cross of Jesus Christ be made to, to, to be void. I don't use fancy words because the power of salvation isn't within my words. It's within the cross of Jesus Christ. It's within the gospel message. So if you lack boldness in here tonight, let me tell you something. You don't have to have all the fancy words. All you have to do is have a willing heart to stand up and to share what the Lord Jesus Christ has done in your life. Doesn't matter about fancy word, doesn't matter if you can talk well, if you can't talk well. We all have a story, we all have something that the Lord has saved us from. And it's up to me and you just to be faithful and share in that. Now, Paul has stood up and he has told these people, he has poured his heart out before them, he has told them about the man that he used to be. He has told them, by the way, everybody knew the man that he used to be. This wasn't something that was hidden. Everybody knew who Paul was. He was a Pharisee. Paul shared with them who he was. He poured his heart out. And he told them about this God that had come and changed his life. And allowed him, gave him the strength, rather, to stand for two solid years waiting on some kind of fair trial and when he gets the opportunity he stands and he continues to tell them about this God that changed his life they have heard all this they have lapped all this up but what is this world's response to a faithful witness Verse 24. And while Paul was saying this in his defence, Festus, the Roman governor, said in a loud voice, Paul, you're out of your mind. Your great learning has driven you mad. 
What is this world's response to a faithful witness? You're a mental case. How many times have you heard it? How many times have you heard people say, the stupid Christians, the fool Christians? By the way, I can say it because I used to be one of those people that would say that. They're all absolutely stone mental. See, there was a couple of things that couldn't be denied. Festus couldn't call Paul a liar. He was unable to call Paul a liar because the, the change was evident in Paul's life. Paul used to be one way and Paul is now another way. Something has took place in that man's life. There is a change. The change was evident. There was a change that took place in Paul's life. And he couldn't deny it. So what could he say? He's a Roman. He knows nothing about Jesus' crucifixion. He's just got into the office. Dead men don't rise from the dead. They don't come back to life. You're a madman, Paul. And you know, he shouts it loud enough for everybody to hear so that he can mock everything that Paul's just said. I want to tell you, in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 2.14, But the natural man receives not the things of the Holy Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Let me put it another way. The preaching of the cross is foolishness to those that perish. What does this world say to a faithful witness that will stand up and tell, tell them about this dramatic change that's happened in their life? What will the world say to me and you when we tell them about this Jesus Christ that's changed our lives? There is that few that will take it on board and you will plant that seed and God willing they will give their life. But most of this world, as Paul tells us, living in the last days, the love of many will grow cold. Men will be lovers of themselves. And they will hate what is good. They will love what is evil. They will be without natural affection. What will they say when they hear this? You're a fool. You're a mental case. Listen, I can't deny. Something happened to you. Because you're not the same man that you used to be. You're not drinking up and down. You're not fighting up and down. You're not robbing left right and center. Something's took place. But I fail to believe. I fail to believe that a man rose from the dead and made you a Christian. You're mad. I don't believe in your God. That is mostly what you're going to hear in this day age. Sorry to say. That is where people have found themselves today. Without natural affection, it doesn't matter how much evidence you offer. Paul was known, Paul, he was known what kind of man he was. Every, it was evident to everybody that he had changed. He is standing there when he doesn't need to, making a defence for his case when he doesn't need to. All he would have to do was just appeal and say, you know what, I got it all done. But no, Paul was willing to believe what he would to the death. King Agrippa. For all the miracles that he might have heard about about Paul, what he performed, for everything that he might have heard about about Jesus Christ, chooses to say it's rubbish. You're a fool. You've read one too many books, and your mind has just carried you away. Paul says this. He said, I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I utter words of sober truth. See, there's two kinds of truth in this world, friend. 
There is subjective truth and there is objective truth. 99% of people today, they choose subjective truth. And I'm going to explain the difference to you. Subjective truth is when I believe something is true to me. Objective truth is when something is universally true. What do I mean? Give me an illustration. When a man decides that he wants to become a woman and he wants to be recognised as a woman with a woman's name that is subjectively true to him to him he's a woman to everybody else that's a man that's the objective truth the truth of the matter is he's a man and his truth only matters to him this is the massive problem that we have today among travelling people and every other kind of people you can possibly think of. When it comes to the scriptures and Jesus Christ and personal testimony and witnessing, they have their own truth that they have made up. I hold God in my own way, which is absolutely no way. They don't even have as good as religion. They have a little dashboard Jesus or a gypsy Jesus and he's got all the tweed and he's got the black pan. Oh, he does. He's even got the walking stick and the carpool. He's the best gypsy you've ever seen. And he tells you, you're okay. Go and rob as many people as you can possibly find because that's how we make our living. Subjective truth. It's true to you. But it's not true. Now please hear me on this. I'm not finished. To the object of truth. Of God's word. This is the truth. Pontius Pilate. When Jesus Christ stood before him. Before he went to that cross. Pilate said. What is truth? Pilate. A man that had been subject to. All the Roman politics and the lies and the things that they would do had a hard job to discern what truth was. And it's the same today. We have a hard job to discern what truth actually is. Well, I want to tell you something. When all the evidence, when all the evidence is pointed towards one truth, then that is the truth. Amen. And what you feel what you feel in your heart is completely irrelevant compared to what the truth of God says. You think you're okay with God? Well, I want to ask you something. Have you had a Paul experience? Has your life changed, friend? No? No? Is it, is it just a, a, a truth that you made up in your own heart to make you feel better? Subjective and objective truth. Just because you think it's real and it's real to you, doesn't make it so. But there's another kind of person that we find in Scripture. And it's King Agrippa. King Agrippa is a very different man. See, King Agrippa, as I've already spoke to you about, now you can understand why I've done the whole prelude. King Agrippa is Jewish. See, he has religion. Very much like Paul. He knows about the Jewish religion. As a matter of fact, he was actually in charge of putting the, the temple priests in their place of office. And Paul, when he realises he's getting absolutely nowhere with this Roman, that he's just ripped him off as being a fool. He turns to King Agrippa, the man that he's been hammering away at all this time. And he says to him, in verse 26, For the king knows about these matters. You know about the Jewish religion. You know about the things that I have been talking about. And I speak to him with confidence, seeing as I am persuaded that none of these things have escaped his notice, for it has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, you have not been living under a rock. You know what's happened in your own town. You know that Jesus Christ came. That he performed miracles. 
that he died on a cross and that he rose again with over 500 witnesses to testify that they had seen the risen Saviour. You know this King Herod. You know about me. You know about the transformation in my life. You've heard all this. What was Herod's conclusion? With all the evidence that he had been given, with all the things that he had seen, what was Herod Agrippa? What was his conclusion? He says this. Agrippa replied to Paul, in a short time, you will persuade me to become a Christian. Now, the translation of that it differs from version to version of the Bible. Now, let me just explain this so you've got a... The best way this is translated is this. If you were given more time, perhaps you might persuade me to be a Christian. So, basically, let's sum it up and what most of your translations will say. I was almost persuaded to become a Christian. How many times have we seen those people that was almost persuaded? I was just there. I, I heard the message. I got a feeling come across me and I was ready to go down. And then I woke up and I came to myself and thought, no, no, no. It's not for me. You almost got me. Ah, I was nearly there. Maybe the next time, but no, no. Not quite there. But let's really think about what's been said there. I was almost persuaded. I was almost a Christian. What? So you were almost forgiven of your sin. You were almost inherited into the kingdom of God. I want to tell you that kneeling is not good enough. That there are no kneelings. No, no. Herod wasn't persuaded. He thought that Paul's argument and all the evidence that was presented to him just, it's just not good enough. What I would prefer, please hear me on this, hear me, and listen, I know I'm, I'm not going to be much longer, please. I know you're starting to get restless, but please, let's hear me on this. I would much prefer my religion that I have. I would much prefer to live in an incestuous relationship with Bernice, my sister. I want to hold on to all those little sins that I have in my life. You almost got me! But I would rather have these things. I would rather have that false reassurance that my religion offers me. And I would rather have this sick, incestuous relationship with my sister than to live and accept the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are many chapters before this where we see in Acts where God pours out his blessing and we see... 3,000 people saved and then we see more and more just added continually daily to the church of Jesus Christ. But the harsh reality is this friend, when we look past all that, we see these two people and for all their riches and for all their splendour, they chose to be chained to their sin and to be chained to the devil in this world than to listen to what the man in chains had to say to set them free. I'm asking you in here tonight, if that's you, if you're caught up in religion, maybe, you know, maybe you, you say I'm a Christian. Maybe you say you're a Christian. Maybe you, maybe you think that you know, you've really met with the Lord if your life hasn't changed. If you are still the same person now that ever you was, you've never had that meeting with Jesus Christ, that experience like Paul did, where you were changed forever. What you have now is you have religion just with a different name. 
Maybe you're somebody that thinks it's all a load of absolute garbage. That we're all a pack of fools. I don't know where everybody's at tonight, but I know one thing. There was a man here that was almost saved. He was on the cusp of accepting and having his life changed. And he chose, listen to me friend, listen to me. He chose the lies of this world and the devil. And he rejected the truth of God's word and Jesus Christ. And that man is now, hear me, that man is now rotting in the pits of hell, regretting the day that he was almost persuaded. Don't be that person. Don't be that person in here tonight. Turn away from your religion. It's never done anything. Never done that there for you all the days of your life. Turn away from your mocking of Christians and accept the truth of the gospel. There was a man that came 2,000 years ago and he died the most cruelest death that was known to mankind. God incarnate clothed himself in the flesh of his own creation and he came to this world. He gave himself over to Gentile soldiers where they would whip his back until it was like a ploughed field. And he would allow his own creation to mock and to slap and to nail him to that rough cross. And he did it all and he would do it all again for you. If you were the one person, the one and only person that had ever sinned. He would come, he would die, he would give it all again. The Bible says that when they had absolutely destroyed his body, when there was no more suffering that he could possibly endure, they had done it all and he had taken it all for you. He had even suffered under the wrath of the Father. They nailed that piece of meat through the hands and through the feet, the hands and through the stars and to the sky and walked upon the walls with the feet. It was nailed to that cross. And then they pierced his side and the very dregs of blood and water that was in his body run out. He gave it all for you, friend. There was nothing else. Let me tell you something. If heaven had more to give, you would have had it. If there was anything better, you would have had it. But the best that heaven had and God could offer came to this earth and died for you and he died for me. And that is the message that Paul preached. And that is the message that has not changed and I preach to you tonight. Regardless of where you think you are. Regardless of you think you're a good person. Regardless of you've got religion. Or regardless of whether you think this is foolishness. You are a sinner, you are broke, God's law, and you need salvation. And there is only one person that can offer that salvation, and it was the man that hung on the cross. And eternal life can only be found by trusting in the Lord. You want to know what happened with King Agrippa? Can I finish on that? King Agrippa chose to reject the message and... Him and his sister, they had relationships with other people afterwards. But at the very end, they always found their way back to each other. The sin that so easily besets. They always found their way back to each other. And they died old people, still incest with each other. His sins followed him to his death. And your sins will follow you to your death. Unless they are dealt with. And they can be dealt with here tonight. All you have to do is surrender and say, Lord, I am a sinner. That's me. I've been caught up in religion. I've been caught up thinking that I'm absolutely fine. That I don't need anything. That I'm not really a bad person. Please, I'm asking you tonight. For everything that you've just heard, turn away from your life of sin and give your life to Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask uh, our brother Richard, will you come back up and just lead us in a time of worship? And please, I'm asking you tonight, I'm going to stand here. 
And if that's you tonight, friend, if you need salvation, please, I'm begging of you, do not leave this place. Do not be almost persuaded. Come forward. And me and the brothers will pray for you. And we can't do anything for you, but we can introduce you to the one that can. God bless you all.